So it's now my uh, privilege to introduce to you um, the brochure, Yannick, who's probably many of you are in, in gold, or at least are already very familiar with. And the brochure uh, came from somewhere else and arrived here in Boulder some years ago, as I know, and has worked on nucleic acid chemistry and the production of aptamers, useful aptamers ever since. So it's great to have him here. Um, thank you very much, Nabarisha, for being around and go for it. Thank you very much, Pippa. And um, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you, Larry, for this invitation. Um, I, in a sense, will leap over a couple of billion years of evolution and talk about where we are now. Uh, so I will begin with what is now known as the central dogma of biology. Uh, these are pretty big words for an important concept. So things started in an interesting way many years ago, and this is where things evolved into, which is that DNA is um, the core of the genome, which is where all the information is stored. Um, because it's precious, it's protected in the nucleus. And when it's time to, to um, activate genes, it makes a copy of RNA um, in a process called uh, transcription. And then uh, the RNA, which now is allowed to move the, into the cytoplasm, which, where there's all kinds of activity, then um, is translated into proteins. Um, so, um, proteins do many things. Um, they are structural components of many cells and tissues. Uh, they're involved in transport and storage. Uh, they're responsible for communication uh, within cells and, and organs and, and also between them. Uh, they mount immune responses, they catalyze reactions and activate genes and many other things. It is because proteins do so many things that they are targets of the vast majority of drugs. Uh, it's protein imbalances that cause disease and drugs, meaning pharmaceuticals, can restore this balance at least to some degree. And most drugs work by directly binding to proteins through some kind of shape complementarity. Uh, a couple of examples, a small molecule drug, Eliquis, uh, binds directly to factor 10A. Another drug, Herceptin, uh, binds directly, which is an antibody, binds directly to HER2. And it is through protein measurements that we can gain insight into disease and health. So even though proteins are encoded in these linear chains of 20 amino acids, they have a strong tendency to fold into intricate shapes. And they come in all shapes and sizes. And so there, with 20,000 genes that encode proteins, we need a collection of shapes which we, with which to measure the proteins, where a, a, a lot of biology is really driven by shape recognition. So we can begin by looking at how antibodies do it. Nature's professional ligands. Everybody knows about antibodies now. They are good things to have to protect us from the coronavirus, and you've all seen these images. With antibodies being these Y-shaped objects that can engage antigens at the tips of the Y. What is going on at the tips of the Y, uh, which is where most of the variability among different antibodies is found, is there are these six loops called complementarity determining region loops, uh, which um, actually directly contact the antigens. So um, with the benefit of a number of structures of antibodies that have been solved over the years, a surprising observation emerged, which is that when you look at the 
main chain or backbone conformations of all of the six CDR loops, they tend to adopt canonical structures, which is shown on this image on, on the left. Now, you might think that this is kind of shocking. How, how can this ever be? Uh, that is, where's the shape diversity that's needed to recognize all these different antigens? So um, the way this problem was solved is by proposing, which was done in the early 90s, that even though you have these similar scaffolds, the way you get to shape diversity is by decorating the scaffolds with side chains that amino acids have. And what you need for that purpose are side chains that are large, uh, ideally greasy or hydrophobic, so that you can get sticky interactions with the protein. And they should have some rigidity as well. So the amino acids that fit this bill the, the, most, the best are tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine. Uh, so just a few examples. We have a co-crystal structure of the antibody on the left, binding a protein antigen on the right. And the interaction surface between these two polymers is in white and yellow on the antibody and protein side. And what we can do is peel this surface open and simply count the amino acids that are on the antibody side or the peritope side, that's, as it's called, which is the part of the antibody that engages protein antigen. When we do that, we find that some amino acids, these three hydrophobic aromatic amino acids, phenylalanine, tryptophan, and tyrosine, are dramatically overrepresented in these regions, as much as fivefold more common than they are on the rest of the antibody surface. So um, following Jack's talk, I don't need to tell you that single-stranded nucleic acids, like proteins, can fold into intricate three-dimensional shapes. Um, good examples are tRNA and ribosomal RNA, and both of these um, bind proteins. So uh, one of the questions that um, was asked some time ago is, 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 is can uh, shorter nucleic acids also adopt intricate three-dimensional structures? What was well known is that, that, that the answer to this question is clearly yes, because uh, there are hydrogen bonding interactions that are made possible through base pairing as well as stacking interactions. And so if we have a nice collection of single-stranded sequences, which are shown on the right, where the colors of the rainbow are intended to indicate that you can make every possible sequence of a short single-stranded nucleic acid, whether it's RNA or DNA. And what, what happens next is these single-stranded sequences tend to fold on their own into a collection of shapes. So a large collection of single-stranded sequences directly translates into a collection of shapes. Uh, tapes turn into shapes. We don't need to understand the rules for folding. And the only thing that we do is then we select from this large set molecules that happen to bind to proteins or other uh, molecules that we are interested in. So this was the beginning of selects and aptamers, uh, which was invented in um, Larry's and Jack's lab. Um, pretty much around the same time. These two papers were published within a few weeks of, of each other. And it's not a coincidence that this was done in labs that had a pretty good understanding about uh, the um, complexity of nucleic acids and their ability to assume uh, a variety of shapes. So the next question is, can aptamers ever be as good as antibodies? Or more generally, can nucleic acid ligands uh, 
ever be as good as protein ligands? And the reason for the question is, well, there are these 20 amino acid side chains, um, which are shown in blue here, which cover all kinds of shapes and sizes, small, large, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, uh, charged, whereas on the nucleic acid side, you only have four bases. So, uh, and when you stand back far enough, the, the bases kind of look alike. So where's the, where's the functional group diversity? So if you are keeping score, not looking so good for the home team at this point. Now, nucleic acids do have some things in, working in their favor, which is that the backbone has a substantially more degrees of um, rotational freedom. There are six rotatable bond, uh, uh, bonds in the backbone itself, and this is not counting the glycosidic bond, whereas there's only two on the protein side. So uh, this means that the backbone shape diversity per monomer is higher in nucleic acids than it is in proteins. Uh, the, the other thing that's worth noting is that aptomers do not have to assume these canonical structures like antibodies do. So uh, we have a score that's a little bit even at this point. And really the, the best argument that we have being hammered by these questions in the early days is just numbers. Uh, a typical antibody germline repertoire is about 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, ninth different sequences when you look at the CDR regions. Whereas we can readily screen nucleic acid libraries up to 10 to the 15 molecules. So, Again, the score is even a little bit, and, and this is log scale. Um, so, nevertheless, um, chemical diversity remained on a lot, a lot of people's minds. And fortunately, there, there is a way to introduce additional chemical diversity at the five position of pyrimidines, uh, which is shown in this image on the lower uh, left. Uh, where through this clever palladium-catalyzed carboxy amidation reaction, as, as it's called, uh, we can introduce a large number of side chains uh, into one of the bases. And we can make both triphosphates, which Jack has mentioned before, which are required for enzymatic steps um, of the SELECTS process, but we can also make variants called phosphoramidides, which are needed for chemical synthesis of nucleic acids. So stepping back for a moment, we begin with unmodified DNA, and then we introduce a single modification that is uniformly substituted throughout the sequence. So, but we can have a whole bunch of different side chains because the chemistry allows us to do that. So if we can have only one per library, what, what should that be? Now, remember this um, over-representation of certain amino acids in the antibodies. We found empirically that the very same types of side chains in the context of nucleic acids does the same thing. That is, it proves the efficiency with which we can identify high affinity ligands uh, to many proteins. And so we have named these reagents slow off rate modified aptomers or somomers to reflect their composition and kinetic properties. Now, um, if we can start this movie, the role of these side chains became clear as we um, learn something uh, about this from crystal structures. Um, I don't think I can start it from here. And hopefully it will work. So um, what we have here is is an aptomer on, on, on the top, shaded in green, bound to a protein, uh, which is in gray, on the bottom. Uh, 
And what you will see if we can get this to rotate is that these side chains um, actually directly contact the protein and create a surface that has exquisite shape complementarity. Maybe I'll give you just a one minute. Sometimes when you try to find this little arrow with a cursor, which is toward the bottom, um, that can work. And maybe if we can go out of the presentation mode, you might be able to see it for just a moment. Okay, well, let's just move on. Um, so um, now, if, if we go on to the next slide, please, or I, I guess I can do that. Uh, uh, we, we now have uh, the benefit of having seen a number of other co-crystal structures, and there are some common themes. Uh, the, 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 the first thing that you can, you can appreciate is this exquisite shape complementarity between the modified aptamers and the proteins to which they bind. Um, in this slide, the modified uh, nucleotides are indicated in red. So you're seeing both the secondary structure as well as the crystal structure. And what became apparent pretty quickly is that not only do these side chains actually directly contact the protein, but they also participate in internal motifs that are quite novel. One such motif is this leucine, uh, not leucine, the zipper motif uh, that is, is observed between um, the modified hydrophobic aromatic side chain, uh, which is shown in, in this middle panel, uh, with the adjacent base. In something that looks like a pseudo base pair, where the side chain and the base are actually connected through a covalent bond rather than being the base pair. Uh, and this can happen without disrupting uh, the two helices. We're now seeing uh, the same motif uh, in a number of co-crystal structures. So this apparently is a good solution for creating folded structures. And the other thing that we're seeing is this frank hydrophobic cores uh, that are made by approximation of the hydrophobic side chains to make these pockets that are known uh, to stabilize folded conformations in proteins. S some of our recent work with Anna Pyle at Yale, uh, which is not yet published, uh, really will, will um, once, once we get to show it, will show you a hydrophobic core that is, you know, substantially larger than this. Uh, so this also appears to be a recurrent motif. Uh, in terms of the amide linker itself, it, it turns out to not be just a dumb linker that's used to connect the side chain with the base, uh, but it first imposes some conformational rigidity uh, because of all the interactions between um, the, the, the electrons in the amide bond with electrons in, in the base. So it's essentially forced to be coplanar with the base. Uh, this kind of rigidity turns out to be important for success of selects. And this amide bond, as in proteins, participates in making both the internal motifs as well as direct context with the protein. Uh, we have now looked at a number of these in these co-crystal structures. And the way we typically draw things, which is on the left, actually turns out not to be at all what these things look like in reality, where the glycosidic bond tends to be in the anti-configuration. Um, uh, the two carbonyls, one from the amide nitrogen and one from uh, 
the four position of the base are always in the ante um, configuration and then the amid bond itself tends to be trans. Maybe not all that surprising, but this is what things look like uh, for, for the most part. We can then turn this by 90 degrees um, and then uh, we are expecting the amid bond to be coplanar with a Eurasil ring. And if there are any deviations, we can, we can see that through this particular dihedral angle. So when we do that, uh, from the number of co-crystal structures that we have, we see that, in fact, the dihedral angle is pretty close to being coplanar, but with some uh, reasonable deviations. And so where we see these deviations, is in cases where the side chains make internal motifs or they participate in protein contact. So the, the energetic cost um, that has to be paid for deviating for the coplanar geometry appears to be compensated in part by other favorable interactions. In terms of size of the epitopes that aptamers and antibodies engage on proteins, they turn out to be quite similar, somewhere between 400 and 1300 square angstroms. Um, the same is true for shape complementarity. Shape complementarity is important because this is really the beginning of both high affinity and high specificity interactions in biology. And to just orient you a little bit, uh, not going into you know, how this is computed, uh, the, the score for shape complementarity is between zero and one, zero worst, one the best. For naturally occurring oligomeric protein interfaces, this shape complementarity index is between seven, 0.7 and 0.76. We see that uh, anti, uh, antibodies have a similar range of around 0.7 as a median and mean. And aptamers, in general, including our somomers, which are labeled here in red, um, have very much the same kind of shape complementarity, which is amazing. These are two entirely different kinds of macromolecules that have different backbones, and yet, they can assume shapes that have the same high degree of shape complementarity. Could, could we go to the next slide, please? Oh, here we go. So um, these Side chains are also convenient handles for what we're calling post-select optimization of aptamers. So we begin by necessity with a uniformly substituted library from which uh, high affinity aptamers arise. But once we identify the sequence, we can take each of the modifications and we can chemically substitute them with something else. So this kind of an exercise is, is familiar to pharmaceutical companies developing small molecules because they go through an exercise called structure activity relationship optimization of small molecules. Uh, this is also akin to what happens with antibodies after the initial germline antibody is formed there is a process called affinity maturation that involves hypermutation and then um, evolution to an, to an antibody that has a much higher affinity. So can we do the same? And, and uh, we absolutely can because aptamers are made uh, chemically. And so I'll give you an example from our IL-6 somomer, which is shown here on the right as it binds to the protein in gray. And it, it, it clearly has these two domains. Um, on the left is, is the so-called G-quartet domain, and on the right is the so-called stem loop domain. Uh, 
and they're uh, linked through what looks like a flexible hinge. And so what we have done is we have uh, cut this hinge along the side and then asked, what is the affinity of the G quartet domain and the stem loop domain? The stem loop domain did not have much binding affinity at all, but the G quartet domain alone, uh, the sequence of which is shown on the bottom here, uh, has maintained a respectable affinity, albeit three orders of magnitude worse than the original aptomer. So um, maybe not surprising because when you look at what crystallographers call temperature factors, which simply means how uh, much things are moving in the crystal, blue meaning the least cold amount of motion and red the most, you can see that the most blue is actually in the G quartet domain. So this is clearly where most binding affinity comes from. And the G quartet domain itself has five modified positions. So what we did is we systematically substituted each of the five with one of 15 variations, which is shown on this left-hand side. And the way this table works is if affinity of the variant is made worse, it's, it's red. So this is the ratio of affinities variant to parent. And if there's an improvement, um, things are blue. So you can see that for the five positions, they have very different tolerance to substitution of any kind. Some really don't uh, tolerate many substitutions at all, but some, like position seven, which is in the first column, you can get substantial improvement in affinity with certain substitutions. The best one is shown on the right, going from this benzyl group to uh, what's called a methylene dioxy group, uh, where we're seeing a, about a 40-fold improvement in the binding affinity with a single substitution. And when we look at the crystal structure um, on the left and then a model of this larger group on the right, we can see that this makes sense because we see a much better fit into this exact binding pocket. So having seen so much success with a single modification, we have moved on to making libraries that have two. And I'm going to briefly step to antibodies again and tell you that um, based on the work done in Genentech, uh, we now know that you can get perfectly good, uh, reasonable antibodies with only two amino acids in the CDR loop. So not 22. But it matters very much which two, and as long as one of them is tyrosine. And you can see on this crystal structure where tyrosine is in blue why that might be the case. So uh, we uh, decided that we wanted to understand what is the best pair to use in the context of nucleic acid ligands. And we prepared a collection of libraries where we used five different modified side chains on deoxyuridine um, coupled with two on deoxycytosine. And you can think of these two top um, side chains, uh, which are sh shown in these what are called CPK models. The top two are primarily hydrophobic, and then the, the lower three um, have more hydrophilic character. When we compare the affinities coming out of this set of selects experiments, uh, where the affinity is shown on the y-axis in the inverted scale, so the better the affinity, the higher the dot. Uh, four different libraries, which are shown on the bottom, and for single modifications, we see what we have seen in the past typically, which is it is these hydrophobic aromatic side chains that give us the best results. More hydrophilic side chains, not so much, including, by the way, the tyrosine, which is shown in red symbols. Now, when we move to two modifications, we see certainly much better affinities overall. And now, when tyrosine is coupled with a hydrophobic side chain, we get some of the very best affinities. 
Uh, there is another consequence of using two uh, uh, modifications, which is a dramatically improved stability to nucleus degradation, which is useful for a number of things, but especially for therapeutics. With these two or doubly modified libraries showing the best stability against nucleases that are found in human serum. So, um, there are some clear advantages, uh, higher affinity, well, more complete epitope coverage on the protein, which has allowed us to identify a larger number of sandwich pairs, enhanced nucleus resistance, and then uh, binding properties that tend to be encoded in shorter sequences, which is also quite important for uh, being able to scale up the synthesis of these reagents. So, what do we do with all this stuff? Um, since the theme of this conference is big data, uh, what we have done, which has been really Larry's dream since 1997, is we have now identified, uh, with the benefit of these improvements in select libraries and procedures, we have now identified somers to more than 7,000 proteins, as well as a method that allows us to measure them concurrently. And the way we do that is cryptically described um, on this top diagram. So we begin with these complexes that are characterized by exquisite shape recognition. We go through a bunch of washing steps that get rid of that gets rid of everything that's not bound. And now we're left with um, nucleic acids only, uh, which we now begin to view as simple tapes that can be hybridized to complementary probe on conventional nucleic acid arrays. So we're now going from shapes to tapes and proteins to DNA. So you might think of this as a bit of a twist on the central dogma, if not really inverting it to achieve this measurement of proteins at large scale. Now, um, there are certain unrecognized medical conditions that tend to be overrepresented among scientists based on a paper that was recently published by Ferrick Fan. So, a hypothesemia is characterized by the absence of hypothesis. And some scientists do hypothesize this is a problem. A related condition is hypothesis, uh, characterized by inability to recognize not all research requires a hy hypothesis. So, if you don't have a hypothesis, you can certainly get a sympathy card that fits the middle. Um, and, but really the bigger problem is, you know, we often don't even know enough to ask, ask the right question, uh, which will get you the cards on, on either side of this. So, let's ask some open-ended questions, such as, you know, what might the pro proteome composition look like at a cancer tissue, in this case from non-small cell lung cancer, compared to adjacent normal tissue or even distant normal tissue. And so using soma scan where we see things go up and down and comparing as a control distant to adjacent, we don't see all that many changes, so think of this as background. But then when we compare tumor to adjacent or distant, we see much more massive changes, things going both up and down. One of the proteins that is upregulated in, in tumor tissue is thrombospondin 2. Now, you, among these many proteins that we measure are some that you would expect to see, but there are quite a few that, that, that you wouldn't have picked out of the hat in 100 years. Uh, so thrombospondin 2 might fit in this category. So now, when we do soma scan, we take the tissue, we grind it up, um, and then run it on soma scan. So by definition, we lose all information about who is where. 
But after you identify some biomarkers that could be interesting, you can then label them with a fluorescent dye and go to the intact tissue and ask where it is. And so we've done that, and we find that there's not a whole lot of thrombospondin II in normal tissue. But when we look at the tumor, uh, and the tumor in this case is labeled in red, we find that it is not in the tumor itself, but in the associated tumor stroma, which feeds the tumor. Um, so this kind of optical resolution where you put a dye on the optimer um, and then stain some tissue uh, has some resolution limitation of around 200 nanometers. Uh, so the typical images you see are on the left. And what we wanted to ask is whether we can jump to the next level of resolution through this super resolution microscopy. What you need for super resolution microscopy is some kind of flickering. And the way the flickering is achieved is by removing the fluorophore from the aptomer and putting it on a comp short complementary probe so that it can dock and fall off with just the right frequency. And so then we go from the middle image, which is diffraction limited, and the, the inset is shown in this little red, um, yellow rectangle, then you move that to a higher resolution. And you can see that it's entirely pixelated, but with super resolution of this type, we can then go to actually single molecule resolution, which allows us to discern the distribution, in this case, EGF receptor on the cell surface of these carcinoma cells and actually see how much of it is present in dimers, which is how these receptors uh, transmit the signals. Um, we can also ask questions about how, how a certain genetic uh, condition um, affects the proteome composition. And we've done that with Down syndrome, uh, where, which is characterized by uh, trisomy at chromosome 21. So in, individuals who have Downs have three chromosomes, 21 rather than two. What we have found in collaboration with scientists at the Linda Cernic Institute is that of the 300 proteins that are different between individuals who have three versus two chromosomes 21, 60% of them are down-regulated and down. Now, that, that, that wouldn't necessarily be the first thing you would think about. These people have an extra chromosome, and yet 60% of proteins are down-regulated. So this gives you an idea how important regulation is in biology. Of the 50 proteins that we measure with this version of SOMASCAN on chromosome 21, only nine are changed, and thankfully they're all upregulated. Most importantly, when we look at all the proteins that are affected, Down syndrome can be characterized as a chronic pro-inflammatory state uh, that also has dysregulated angiogenesis and complement consumption. Now, Down syndrome is not exactly a subtle genetic change, so can we detect changes that you know, we all have through these single nucleotide polymorphisms that are peppered throughout our genome. And to ask that question, we collaborated with a group at the University of Cambridge and Merck uh, uh, with samples from 3,300 blood uh, donors who are, are generally he healthy people. Among them, there were more than 10 million SNPs. And we, then we analyzed this uh, group for changes in the 3,600 proteins that we're measuring at a time. And we've seen just under 20,000 what are called associations between SNPs and proteins. These include both associations between the genes that have the SNPs and the proteins they encode, which are called cis associations, as well as um, 
mutations in the gene and then the effect on other proteins, trans associations, and which are arguably more interesting because it allows you to really understand protein pathways better. So there are more than 1,100 trans associations. Almost 90% are not previously, have not been previously re reported. So scaling this up to many conditions, what we are currently doing is we're measuring all 7,000 proteins, establish some kind of baseline, and then we ask, what is the change from this baseline uh, depending on whether a person has condition A, B, C, D, E, and so on. And things can go both up and down. Again, so we're looking at groups of proteins that, we, that are changed. And through the magic of um, bioinformatics, we can compute scores that give you certain risks. So, um, here's a collection of things that we are currently measured, that were developed by our medical group and bioinformatics group. There are things that uh, you might like to know about. Um, the medical conditions are generally on the left, so unresolved cardiovascular risk, uh, VO2 max, uh, or card cardiorespiratory fitness, glucose tolerance, NASH, propensity for heart, failure. But then, but then on the other side, liver fat, uh, visceral fat, uh, percent um, body fat, lean body mass, and so on. Um, I want to now address briefly polygenic conditions, um, uh, of which there are quite a few. And Alzheimer's disease is a really good example which is highly heritable, but highly polygenic. Uh, so this just means that uh, mutations that are spread in, in the genome collectively contribute to propensity for Alzheimer's disease. There are many other examples of this type, coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, autism. And if you are a pharmaceutical company pinpointing the right targets for therapeutic intervention is extremely important, but very difficult. And so it is through concurrent measurements of proteins that uh, we can much more fully understand these conditions. And in a more general sense, um, proteins work in networks. This is really their um, natural habitat. And we do know quite a bit about pathways and networks at this point, uh, but really there's much that we don't know. And so by doing multiple protein measurements of the type that we do, uh, we can enhance our understanding and really connect more of the dots for combined knowledge that leads not only to more efficient drug discovery, but really uh, improved understanding of the biology. So there is a common theme in the kind of work that we do. And this really, a lot of it uh, comes from the fact, you know, the way Larry tends to think about science. So it, you, you really want to ask every question that you can and then let the answers guide you so we can select from all possible variations um, rather than only relying on our limited knowledge. So and this begins with really identifying the best aptamers from every sequence we can make to testing every protein that we can and identifying those that can develop into a best test. And then once we have this collection of tests, we can ask which one of them gives us the best information about the status of our health. So I'm going to conclude with a few words about drugs, and aptamer drugs in particular. Aptamers can be drugs. Macugen is, yes, it's currently the only example. And the reason that Macugen made it all the way through to approval for a condition called uh, age-related mac macular degeneration is because 
it was a good match for the intrinsic properties of aptamers, the drug target and the indication. There are quite a few other opportunities here uh, and not just in the eye. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about the work that's not yet been published, uh, which is our work on the coronavirus. The idea behind our work is really summarized in this slide, and it's pretty simple. Uh, we would like to disrupt the ability of the virus, which is the spike protein, which engages uh, H2 receptor uh, that's found on many different cell types in the human body, and, and prevent it from the binding, thereby interfering with infection. For this purpose, and much of this work was done by Amy Gelinas in our group, um, we wanted to, uh, to really identify a nice set of reagents that cover a range of epitopes on the spike protein. So what we did is we used a number of different constructs of the protein that included the S1 domain, the S2 domain, and then um, receptor binding domain, and so on. Uh, and then we used five different uh, modified libraries for a total of 25 selects experiments. Having now a collection, and which all actually work quite well, to give us a collection of more than 200 reagents, from which we selected 92 based on their binding properties and also where they bound. And we collaborated with William James's group at Oxford to test uh, this collection against the live virus in vitro. And the way this, um, this assay works is you grow viral cells uh, and then you expose them to a virus that has varying amounts of these different aptamers. So of the 92, we identified 13, which are shown in these green, yellow, uh, green arrows uh, that uh, inhibit the virus growth growth by more than 80%. And you can see that one of them stands out, which is uh, kind of the lower left side of your screen. And uh, we have then confirmed that through titration experiments that uh, this reagent um, inhibits the virus with quite good um, potency, uh, which is shown in black. But what has been really encouraging is to see that this particular ligand maintains potency against this South African variant B1351. We have then moved on to test a number of candidate reagents. The lead one is on the uh, far left column against a few other variants just for binding affinity. And we see that in addition to the South African variant, we also maintain good binding affinity against both the UK117 and the Brazilian P1 variant. And um, um, with uh, a nice collection of reagents, what we are uh, thinking about doing is actually linking these into heterodimeric constructs to give us both higher potency as well as uh, to stay ahead of the emergence of variants because it's more difficult for the virus to develop mutations at two different sites. And uh, with that, I, I, I uh, want to thank a large number of people with whom I've worked over the years um, and our colleagues at Totsuka, Linda Cernick Institute, University of Cambridge, Max Planck, and University of Oxford, and also Larry, who I've known for now 30 years uh, for his, um, for a great number of fun scientific di discussions and also for being a friend. So, thank you.